Hello, hello. Okay, I put it on mute. That was the problem. It was already on. Uh, but again, uh, good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Hope you've had a good, good weekend. Uh, I know I did. Uh, I was able to go to Camp Ida this weekend. I've been there like four times this year. Uh, I went in the summer. I went on two men's retreats, and then I went yesterday for our fourth session retreat. Uh, J.J. Hendricks is the uh, director of that, and so that was good. I got to uh, do a little bit of, of speaking, and we uh, talked on the subject of growth, and so that was, that was very good. And So again, I hope you've had a good week uh, as well. Now, just to remind everyone, of course, this is a new quarter, and uh, we have begun a study in Philippians. And uh, remember last week, we began in chapter 1. Well, remember, we introduced the book. We went over some introductory material, and then we began in chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. We were not able to finish that section, and so today we'll be finishing up verses 9 through 11. And then we're going to continue into verses 12 through uh, 18 this morning. And that will be our plan for today. Before we do that, I'd like to begin with a word of prayer. And then after that, I want us to kind of refresh our memories on some introductory material. So let's bow for a, a, a brief word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We're so, so very blessed, so very thankful that we have the opportunity to meet together as your church, as your people, uh, to proclaim the praises of you who called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. Father, let us never forget who you are and what you've done for us. And Father, let us uh, fan the flame of, of passion and fire uh, in remembering who you are. Remember who we serve. And Father, that will be enough to, to help us in our, in our drive to carry out your will. Father, we love you. Thank you for all that you do for us. Please bless our study. It's in the name of your Son that we pray these things. Amen. Uh, so again, refreshing our memories on some introductory material. Uh, what region was uh, the church at Philippi in? It was in the region of Macedonia. It was in Europe. Uh, remember also what chapter of the book of Acts that uh, we find Paul interacting or establishing the church. Remember it was in Acts chapter 16. That's very important. Remember we noticed uh, three things there from Acts 16 in which Paul did while he was in that city. He established a church, of course. But we see he converted Lydia. We see that he faced opposition, he was imprisoned, and then after that, of course, we see he converted the Philippian jailer. Three major things he did while in uh, that city. I remember the reasons why Paul wrote this letter. We proposed some purposes as to why Paul took up pen and paper to you know, pen this letter. Uh, one of the reasons was, in essence, to show his gratitude for the gift that they had sent him. That's really what this, this book goes back to. The Philippians had sent Paul a gift, uh, a, a, uh, some kind of, of gift of aid. Now, we don't know what the gift was specifically, uh, but we do know that it was a gift of aid for his necessities. And when you think of necessities, it was probably uh, food, uh, clothing, or money, one of those things, uh, probably. But nonetheless, we see that Paul wrote, especially in chapter 4, uh, concerning his gratitude to the Philippians for doing that for him. Uh, another proposed purpose, uh, purpose to why this letter was written was to ease the brethren's mind about Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was the messenger and brother in Christ who brought that gift uh, to Paul from Philippi. And uh, the brethren had heard that while he was on that journey, he became sick, so sick that he almost died. And so Paul wrote this letter to ease their minds about him, that he's, you know, he, he told them what happened and, and how everything worked out in the end. Uh, another reason, another proposed reason as to why Philippians was written was to warn of the opponents. Remember we mentioned, made mention of the fact in Acts 16 that when Paul was there, when he established the church there, uh, he did face opposition. And he actually references that later in chapter 1. And so he's telling the brethren that, hey, uh, don't, be, uh, don't be worried of your opponents. You know, ever since the church has been there, there have been opponents. And there will continue to be opponents there uh, seemingly in Philippi. Uh, but nonetheless, he warns them of those opponents in chapter 1. And then we also mentioned another reason why Paul wrote, wrote this letter. Uh, he did the four C's, as he does in every single letter. He commended, he commanded, he cautioned, and he corrected. Uh, the, that's something that he did in every single one of his letters. And the Philippian letter, though unique, though different, uh, was no exception. He commended, he commanded, he cautioned, and he corrected. And so again, those are just some... Uh, uh, things that we noticed last week as to some introductory material. Now, 
And we want to go back to the context that we began last week. Remember, we began chapter 1, and we wanted to cover verses 1 through 11. We were not able to finish, and so we want to look at verses 9 through 11. Now, let me refresh your memories as to what we noticed thus far. Remember, uh, we simply noticed the heading of the letter. You know, we see the author, the recipients. And then we also noticed, uh, especially, really the main thing Paul does here in verses 1 through, I guess, down to verse 8, is he really commends them. You know, he really just lays it all on the line. Hey, you're in my heart. I, I thank the best of you. You're in my prayers. I'm thankful for you. He just, he builds them up. He commends them. And that's one of the major things, main, the main things uh, that Paul does here in the first uh, few verses here. And then we get to verses 9 through 11, the verses that we did not get to last week, the verses we're about to notice. And here we're going to see Paul's uh, prayer requests for the Philippians. In essence, Paul's telling them what he's prayed for on their behalf. Now, if you notice back up in verse, uh, let's see here, verse 4, notice he, he talks about prayer. He says here, uh, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. Okay, And so he talks about prayer. He mentioned how he's thankful for them. He thanks God in his prayers for them. But he mentions here requests. And he doesn't really mention a request here. He goes on to talk about, I make my requests with joy. And that joy is for your fellowship in the gospel until now. And so, in other words, here's what Paul's saying. I am joyful that you have endured with me in the gospel. That you're still faithful today. But he just kind of you know, mentions requests there. I make requests with joy. And he talks about that joy, but he doesn't say the requests right there. Well, now we're going to see those requests. He's going to go on to talk about in that, those prayers that he gives to God, some of the things that he asked God for on behalf of the Philippians. And so that is what verses 9 through 11 is about. And so let's notice that. Let's look here. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, uh, looking here at verse 9. Notice with me what the Bible says. The Bible says, And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all uh, discernment. Okay, so we're going to see here again some prayers, some requests he had for the Philippians. Now here's a tip, okay, here's a tip. When you look through verses 9 through 11, at least in the New King James Version, every single one of these requests, these prayers, begins with the word that, okay? And this I pray, notice he says in verse 9, that. Here's the first request. Okay, so notice in verse 9 here, here is his first request, his first prayer request, his first supplication, if you will, for the Philippians that he prays to God. Here it is. He prays that their love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. Okay, this is what he prays for, that they have love, but it's a certain kind of love, a love that abounds in knowledge and discernment. Now, how? Does our love abound and grow in knowledge and discernment? Well, notice with me the word in here. The word in. This, that's where this love is in. That's where it, uh, as the word in indicates, resting or residing. This love rests. It resides in knowledge. It resides, it rests in uh, discernment. And so the idea behind Paul's prayer here is that this love should be an educated affection. Okay? An educated affection. Barnes says in his commentary, not a blind affection, but an intelligent affection. And so, again, he says here, this, this abounding love, it resides in discernment. Again, Barnes says in his commentary that Paul wished that their religion would be intelligent and discriminating. And so, here's what we're seeing here. Of course, we as Christians are called to love. No one would dispute that. We are supposed to be people of love. Uh, but that... Love that we are to have is not to be a rampant affection, a love that just loves anything, okay? This is to be a love that loves the right things, a love guided by the Word of God, a love guided by the knowledge that we're given in God's Word. You know, no one would dispute, of course, that God is love. I mean, you look to 1 John 4, God is love. But, you know, many people whenever they see that, they don't understand that just because God is love and just because we are called to love does not mean that God does not also have the capacity to hate and that we are also aren't called to hate some things too because we are. Remember, Jesus hated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. In Proverbs chapter 6, the Bible tells us that uh, there are six things, yea, seven things that God hates. And he mentions a few things there, you know, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. 
Okay, and so when you think about love, we have to, you know, kind of define our terms here. What things are we to love? Well, we're to love the things that God teaches us to love. Not a rampant affection, but a love that resides in knowledge, a love that resides in discernment. And so again, remember, Jesus hated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Proverbs 6 talks about things that God hates. Romans 12, 9 says, abhor or hate what is evil, cling to what is good. And so what we're seeing here is that loving the right things means we're going to hate the wrong things. And so again, whenever we talk about God being love and how we are called to love, that does not mean that we don't also hate some things too. There are things that we've got to oppose, things that we've got to uh, not love. And if we truly love love, if we love mercy, if we love righteousness, if we love holiness, then we're going to hate those things that oppose love and righteousness and holiness. And that's exactly who God is. He is love. He's everything good. And he does not like, he hates the things that are opposite of that. And so again, that's what uh, uh, Paul is teaching, and that's what Paul's praying for the Philippians on their behalf, that they have the right kind of love, that they have a love that rests and resides in knowledge and discernment, a love that loves the things that God teaches us to love. Okay, and so that's what he, he prays for here first of all. Now notice in verse 10, here's our second prayer request, beginning with the word that. He says, that you may approve the things that are excellent. This is his second prayer request for the Philippians. And so let me give you some definitions for the word excellent here. Uh, Strong says the word excellent means to surpass, be better, to differ from, to be more excellent, or be of more value. Okay. Notice with me also Thayer's definition. The word excellent could mean to distinguish between good and evil, between lawful and unlawful, to approve of things that excel, to differ from one, to excel, surpass. And so the idea here being uh, that we need to approve of and, and go after those things that are better, those things that are valuable, those things that are good and worthwhile. He says to approve of these kinds of things. And of course, the implication of that is not the things that are opposite of that, not the things that are, are worthless, uh, bad, invaluable, subpar, and by extension, worldly uh, or earthly things. You know, Hebrews uh, chapter 5 and verse 14 tells us that we are to be discerners uh, between what is good and what is evil. We are to approve of those things that are excellent, those things that are simply uh, better. In fact, we could reference uh, chapter 4 of the book of Philippians. Remember Philippians 4, 8, the famous words we find there, you know, a big long list of all the things we are to meditate on. And he says, you know, those things that are virtuous and praiseworthy. Meditate on these things. And really that whole list is just simply things that are excellent. Uh, and so that might be a good, I guess you could say, reference uh, to the, the kinds of things we ought to approve of, the kinds of things we ought to think of and go after, those things that are excellent, those things that are simply better, those things that are good. Now notice here is the third prayer request. Notice, starting with the word that here in verse 10, he says, that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. Sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. This is what he prays for. And so the word sincerity, it could mean genuine or pure, Strong says. And of course, God doesn't want us to just obey uh, his laws mindlessly, but to do them sincerely, do them with the right heart. God has always called us to do that. You know, we're not called just to simply be Christians on the outside, to just do things that are good, but we're called to be good people. And if we are good people, if we have the right mindset, then we're going to do good things. We're called to be more than just people of action. We're called to be people of, that's who we are, I guess you could say. Uh, but again, we see here that we are to be sincere. He also prays that they'll be without offense, that they'll not be found uh, unfaithful or guilty, uh, that they'll reside in that faithfulness and that guiltlessness until the day of Christ, he says. And so this is his uh, third prayer request here, that they will be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. Now notice, continuing to verse 11, he's going to continue those thoughts that he just mentioned here in verse 10. Okay, so notice verse 11. He says, being filled with the fruits of the Spirit, or excuse me, the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Okay, so notice, this is an extension of verse 10. He just ended verse 10 by saying that I want you to be without offense until the day of Christ. Now he's going to go on to tell us how we do that. How can I be without offense? How can I be guiltless? 
How can I be faithful until the Lord comes or until I die? How can I do that? Well, notice he goes on to say here, here's the answer, to be filled, to be full of the fruits of righteousness. The fruits of righteousness. Remember, those fruits of righteousness are also called the fruits of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5 and uh, verses 22 and 23, we see there the, those things that are righteous, those things that are of the Spirit. And friends, the truth is that if we are filled with those fruits, if we're filled with love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, etc., all those fruits we see, the fruits of righteousness, the fruits of the Spirit, then we will not be found guilty whenever we come in the presence of God. If we're filled with those, if we embrace those, if we become those, then, my friends, there's no way we're going to be found guilty because we are filled with the fruits of righteousness, the fruits of the Spirit. And so again, these are our Paul's three prayer requests, his supplications on behalf of the Philippians, that they have a love that abounds in knowledge, that they love the right things, that they uh, uh, prove those things that are excellent, and that they be pure and without offense that they have Christ. How can we be without offense? Of course, embrace and be filled with the fruits of righteousness, the fruits of the Spirit. Well, that concludes the section that we did not uh, get to last week. Are there any questions, any comments concerning what we've noticed? Any of those prayer requests that Paul prayed for on behalf of the Philippians? Any thoughts? Brother Doug. Well, there in verse, ooh, there in verse 9, he, he mentions knowledge and discernment. And those aren't exactly the same things. And I think it's noteworthy we, we notice that knowledge is knowing what God's will is, discernment is kind of applying it mm. and be able to use it to determine by God's will what right and what wrong is. And uh, some people have knowledge but forget about the, the application of it and the discernment. And so I, I think it's kind of noteworthy that he wants them to have both of these things. They're very closely related, but they're not exactly the same. All right, Brother Ronnie's going to man the mic for me. Uh, but Brother Doug brings up a good point. Uh, knowledge and discernment, they are not the same thing. Knowledge is kind of a, a revealed understanding of things. You know, God tells us this and that, and we can know that. Uh, but discernment is, uh, like Doug said, the application of those things. We mentioned just a moment ago Hebrews 5. Uh, I believe it was verse 12. You know, we are to be discerners of what's good and what's evil. The Bible, and I've mentioned this before in lessons, the Bible does not, you know, uh, I guess s mention every sin by name in the Bible. Okay, the Bible does not mention everything that is evil that is wrong, but it does cover everything through principle, through the things that it teaches. Uh, you know, we mentioned you. Know, we could mention uh, Romans chapter one. Those who were, you know, they had embraced immorality. They were inventors of evil things. You know, we can come up with more and new evil. There in Galatians chapter 5, you know, the Bible tells us that, uh, or mentions there the works of the flesh, and that list ends with, and the like, meaning that was not a complete list of all the bad things that we could do with our bodies, you know. And so the Bible does not mention every sin by name, but it does cover everything through the principles. And so we can know what's right and what's wrong, but we also have to discern. There are also some things we have to tell, well, this is good, and this is evil, this is excellent. And this is not so great, you know. So we have to apply the things that the Bible teaches as well. All right, so uh, let's uh, pick up here in uh, verse uh, 12. We're going to continue our study. And uh, so notice with me verse 12 here. Now before we get into this, let me kind of share with you uh, kind of what this section is about. I think we could entitle this next section, verses 12 through 18, Paul's Reason for Rejoicing. Okay, Paul's reason for rejoicing. Now, Paul is going to share with us, and as we know in this context, Paul is in prison. He is in chains, okay? But yet he's found a cause to rejoice despite his situation. And so really what we're going to see more than anything is uh, really Paul's great attitude in the midst of a pretty negative situation. And so again, Paul's reason for rejoicing. So let's read verse 12, and the Bible says here, Philippians 1.12, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Now, what are those things that have happened to him? Again, uh, as we mentioned in the context here, and as Paul is also going to mention as we read on, uh, his chains, his imprisonment, the suffering that he's facing, the impending trial 
that he's uh, about to go through. And so uh, that is what he's facing. He is suffering persecution for the cause of Christ. And Paul is saying here that these things that have happened to me, they've actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Now we can take two things uh, from this, uh, two things from Paul's statements here. For one, uh, this would uh, perhaps ease the minds of these beloved brethren. Uh, we know that these brethren love Paul, and Paul loves these brethren. Him and Philippi, they were uh, very close to one another, and that was the reason why they sent a gift to him. They, they uh, had heard that Paul was in prison, and so they wanted to do something for him. They sent, uh, sent a gift of aid to help him. Uh, and so Paul's writing this letter as a, a response of gratitude in that, and we see here that uh, Paul is going to you know, tell them that, hey, all is well, in essence. Uh, I know that you're concerned about me. I know you've heard of my state. But nonetheless, uh, I have a great attitude. I have a, a positive outlook on my situation. I know I'm in prison. I know I'm in chains. But nonetheless, what's happened here, look at it in this way. It's actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. And that's, that's really what Paul cares about. Uh, and so again, he's in essence saying, all is well. And we can clearly see his uh, positive attitude here. Uh, so again, even though negative things have happened to him, he eases their minds by assuring them that he's doing okay. He has a positive mindset about all of this. Now, another thing that we can take from Paul's statements here is, in essence, he's showing the positive effects of his situation. Uh, again, he's easing their minds. He's saying, hey, all is well. But he's also showing the effects of what has happened here by my being in prison. He's in prison. He's in chains. But things have actually worked out. Things have actually worked out for the good. And that's really what's important to Paul. You know, when you read about Paul, when you look to his attitude, really, you know, you look throughout the epistles, the truth is Paul cared less about Paul and more for the gospel. And that really is the truth of the matter. In fact, I think it's worth mentioning that, uh, you know, in the actual prison epistles, remember there are four, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. And Philippians is said to be the last. Uh, said to be the last written in 63 A.D. But in the two previous prison epistles, in Ephesians and Colossians, uh, Ephesians 6, 18 through 20, and Colossians 4, 3 and 4, Paul asked for prayers for himself. But whenever he asked for prayers, what were those prayers about? Whenever Paul asked for prayers for himself, they were never about his situation. They were never about, hey, pray to God that my situation will get better. It was always about the gospel. It was either for boldness to preach the gospel or for opportunities to preach the gospel. And so again, Paul's you know, telling the brethren here that, hey, you don't need to worry about me. In fact, he's going to go on to say in chapter 4, I've learned to be content in every situation. I'm okay. I'm okay. So he's telling the brethren here that, hey, I know you're worried about me. I know you're concerned. But nonetheless, I have a great outlook, and things have worked out. Things are going well. Things are working out better for me than, than I can imagine. I, I'm, I'm not really concerned about me. I'm okay. I'm content. But the gospel is being spread, and that is what really matters. So he was a selfless man who had his priority on spiritual things. Now, keep these prayers in mind. I want to reference these again in just a few moments. The prayer he prayed in Ephesians and Colossians, uh, again, about... You know, his, his request for himself. Not that his situation would improve, but for boldness or opportunities in the gospel. Do we have a comment here? Well, it reminds me of the verse in Romans eight twenty eight, where it says, God causes all things to work together for good for them that love the Lord. So that's a perfect verse for this situation. I would agree. In fact, whenever we mention this again, we're kind of going to kind of reference that idea, the fact that God has done abundantly beyond what Paul asked or thought. I think we're seeing here an answer to Paul's prayer. Paul prayed for boldness. He prayed for opportunity, and God far exceeded that. And we'll see, we'll see that in just a moment. But again, we see here Paul saying that all has worked out for the good. Specifically, uh, his suffering played a part in the gospel being furthered. Uh, any other comments concerning verse 12? Any thoughts? Okay. Notice with me verse 13. Verse 13. The Bible says, So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And so, again, Paul's referencing the fact that this is why I'm here. These are the things I'm talking about here uh, from verse 12. The things that have happened to me, talking about his chains, talking about his imprisonment. 
Uh, that's what he's referring to here in this context. But here's what Paul's saying here in this verse. Again, let me repeat this. It has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Paul is in essence saying, everyone knows why I'm here. Everyone knows why I'm in prison. Not just the praetorium, the prison guard, but all the rest, he says. Everyone knows why I'm here, why I am in prison. Uh, and it's, it's apparent, it's obvious as to why Paul was in chains. It wasn't because he was a murderer. It wasn't because he was a thief. It wasn't because of anything like that. In fact, we could say that more than being a prisoner of Caesar, he was, as he called himself, a prisoner of Christ. Uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 3 and verse 1. And so again, uh, he was not in chains for guilt of violating the law of the land or anything like that. In fact, he was in prison for keeping the law of God. That was why he was in prison, for, for preaching the truth. And I think that's one great thing that we can take from this. Um, I'm reminded of the words of Peter in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 and uh, verses 15 and 16. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 if you'd like to look there with me. And uh, verses 15 and 16. Notice what Paul says here in 1 Peter 4, in verse 15. He says, Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, or an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. And I think that very much applies to the situation that Paul's in. Everyone knows why he's there in prison. The whole palace guard and all the rest, they know why he's in chains. It wasn't because he was guilty of breaking the law. He wasn't a murderer. He wasn't a thief. It was because he was a prisoner of Christ. It was because he stood for the truth. And everyone knew why he was there. And that's the point that Paul's making here. You know, I think there's something we can take from this. Probably a lot of things we can take from this. But one thing I want to mention here is the idea of transparency. Okay, Paul was transparent. He wasn't hiding anything. People knew who he was. And really what you see is what you get. He didn't hide his Christianity. That was very evident to all. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, we're going to see in, in uh, chapter 4, you know, Paul says the household of Caesar greets you. You know, he actually converted people of Caesar's house, relatives of Caesar. And so it was known to everyone, and he used that as an opportunity to preach the gospel. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, I think what we can take from here is, is Paul's transparency. You know, Christians should be an open book, no evil to hide. Uh, good people, not just on the outside, but on the inside too. And I think that's something we see in Paul here. Notice verse 14. Continuing here, verse 14. The Bible says, And most of the brethren in the Lord having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. And so again, Paul's talking about his imprisonment. He's talking about the chains, okay? That's what this context revolves around. But he's saying here that, that fellow Christians of his, hearing of Paul's circumstances, have actually become emboldened in preaching the gospel. And friends, think about this. This circumstance was a huge deal. I'm sure Paul was the talk of every church in, in, you know, in the world, probably, uh, because you know, Rome was the superpower of that day. And he was about to stand before Caesar. He was among Caesar's household. He was in the palace guard. And so this was a huge deal. It would be like if one of our brethren, because of their boldness and zeal in preaching the gospel, would stand before the Supreme Court because they were faithful. We would, I mean, we would be talking about that, brother. We would probably be inspired and emboldened because of what they are doing for the faith. And we would probably say, man, I'm so proud of that, brother. And we might be, again, emboldened uh, to preach the gospel, too, because of what they're doing. And that's exactly what happened here. Paul, because of, his, because of this major news, he's going to stand before Caesar. He's imprisoned there in Rome, the capital of the superpower of the day, the, the reigning nation of the day. And yet we see here that because of that, he has inspired his brethren. And that was, again, a, a very huge deal. And so Paul's example helped embolden the brethren. This encouraged Christians to, to be less fearful uh, when they preach the gospel. And you know what? Paul takes what he can get. <laughs> he takes what he can get, like what he gets, if you will. Uh, and he counts this as a victory. He counts this as success if his chains could inspire the brethren. And that's exactly what happened. Again, this is a not necessarily a good situation. If this was any other individual, the person writing would probably be kind of negative, you know. But nonetheless, Paul, he's very positive. He's very optimistic about his circumstances. And again, he takes what he can get. And 
what he's seeing here is that, hey, I know this is a bad situation, but great things have come from it. My brethren have been inspired to preach the gospel. Uh, I think it's fitting to mention here, you know, Paul's concern and prayer for the gospel. We just mentioned a moment ago those two prayers. I wanted you to keep those in mind. In Ephesians and Colossians, his prayer, his requests for the brethren to pray for himself was for boldness to preach the gospel and for opportunities to preach the gospel. And going back to what Brother Paul Lamb said, I think, Paul, I think what we're seeing here in this last prison epistle is God actually answering those prayers. That was his prayer, his request for boldness and for opportunities. And I think God did abundantly beyond what Paul asked or thought. Paul asked for boldness. He asked for opportunities. What are we seeing here? We're seeing that not only was Paul emboldened, but his brethren were emboldened too. We're not only seeing that Paul had opportunities. He preached to Caesar's household and converted some of Caesar's household. But we also see the brethren making opportunities to preach the gospel too. I think we're seeing Paul's prayers answered here in Philippians. That's what he prayed for in Ephesians and in Colossians. Boldness and opportunities for himself. But yet we see here God had abundantly beyond what he asked or thought. And we see that not only in Paul, but also his brethren. I think that's a, an interesting thought to think about, that really those prayers that he prayed, those things that he was adamant in, in prayer about, came to fruition, not only in himself, but also his brethren. And so I think that's something worth mentioning here. And that's, you know, that's one reason why we pray for boldness. We have to be bold if we're going to preach the truth, because preaching the truth can be a, a scary thing, you know, because people's emotions are evolved, you know, and... You know, we don't even have it half as bad as they did in the first century. You know, you know, they were willing to stone you on the spot, you know, if you even offended them a little bit. But nonetheless, they kind of do the same thing today with their words, but it's really not the same thing. You know, we, we really haven't faced what they faced in the first century. Uh, but nonetheless, we're seeing here the, really that that's why we need boldness. That's why we pray for boldness, because preaching the truth, it can be. A scary thing to get up and talk about things that are going to offend people, talk about things that are going to, you know, make people emotional, if you will, things that will get them angry at you. But, you know, if you're going to be a true preacher of the gospel, you've got to stand up against that. You can't be scared. You can't be fearful. And I think that's certainly one thing that, you know, is, you know, kind of a, a trouble with younger preachers. I think we see that in Timothy. You know, Timothy, he seems to be indication that he might have been fearful. Paul said, God's not giving you a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And there seems to be indication there that Timothy might have been a little fearful, might have been a little scared. Uh, but Paul's trying to encourage this young preacher. And, you know, friends, we've just got to stand up and preach the word. No matter what the world does, they get in our face and gnash their teeth at us, we've got to stand up and preach, thus saith the Lord. And that's all that matters in the end. We're not going to answer for what people judge us by. We're going to answer for what God judges us by, the word of God. We have a, a comment here, Brother Paul Lamb. When it comes to boldness, do you think Paul's mindset ever went back to Stephen, seeing him speak the truth, and of course the cost that it that he paid for being bold? And you know, Paul eventually said, "We must obey God rather than man." Mm. So maybe Stephen had a great influence on Paul. Mm. That's a good point, uh, and. You know, that's ultimately what it comes down to. We must obey God rather than man. I think we see that idea really amplified in, in the prophets, the minor prophets and, and the major prophets. I believe it was Jeremiah and Isaiah. You know, these men, they preach for so long, and they <laughs> receive so much persecution and so much rejection, but they continue with the Lord. And, you know, that's the greatest inspiration for, for preaching the truth. We must be bold when we proclaim the truth. Notice verse 15. Continuing on here, the Bible says here in verse 15, Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some from goodwill. Now here Paul's going to mention, in essence, two categories of Christians. We might even say two categories of preachers. Uh, two categories of those who proclaim the gospel. Uh, the first is those who preach with ulterior motives. And the second is those who preach Christ the right way. Now he's going to go on in the, in the next two verses and, and expand upon that, but you know, I think there's one thing that we can take from you know, these statements here. You know, people have stated you know, in times past, and especially in more recent times, how they don't want to be a part of quote-unquote church because you know, there are hypocrites in the church. 
But friends, when you look to uh, the scriptures, there are hypocrites everywhere. You know, I think it was Brother Ken Hope who just mentioned in a lesson not too long ago, there's, in the children of Israel, there's always going to be an Achan. Among the disciples, there's going to be a Judas. Among the Christians, there's going to be a Diotrephes. That's always the case, and we're seeing that here. This is nothing new. There have always and will always be hypocrites among us. We, of course, know that one day that won't be the case. We won't have to worry about that. One day God's going to separate the sheep from the goats. One day they will not be in our midst. But nonetheless, so long as we live in this life, uh, that's going to happen. And that's what we're seeing here, that even in the first century, there were hypocrites. And that's not something that we're, we really have to... I don't know. I think it's just an excuse. People concern themselves, but oh, there's hypocrites. That's not a major excuse. Because really when you think about it, here's what they're doing. They are excusing themselves from God's great salvation. They are excusing themselves from the joy and the peace that God blesses us with. They're excusing themselves from the blessings of God, the promises of God, all because there are a few people who aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Does that sound like a valid reason to cheat yourself of your own salvation? I don't think so, not at all. So it's just an excuse, really, an excuse to not follow God, an excuse to not be a part of the church and, you know, you know stop sinning, stop living how they want to do, uh, to do, to do their life, I guess you could say. But uh, again, that's in essence what, what people do. They deprive themselves, they excuse themselves of God's great salvation just because there are a few people who aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Hypocrites have always been here. And they're always going to be here. It's nothing new. It's nothing new. And so we just have to trust God. We just have to look to Him. Just don't look to people. Because if you look to people, if you put your trust in people, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be disappointed if that's where your focus is at. We've got to keep our focus on the Lord. We've got to keep our focus on Him, on the Word. And ultimately, they will be dealt with one day. Ultimately, there won't be hypocrites among us. And so we have to keep that in mind. Don't cheat yourself of heaven. Don't cheat yourself of eternal life just because there are some people who aren't doing what you're supposed to be doing. We're going to only answer for ourselves, not anyone else. And that's, that's what we've got to remember. That's what we've got to think of. Notice verse 16. He's going to go on to talk about uh, those Christians who preach the gospel with wrong motives, ulterior motives. Notice verse 16. He says, uh, The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, Supposing to add afflictions uh, to my chains. Uh, so here Paul is, in essence, exposing the, uh, the motives of those who preach with ulterior motives. He mentions here, here's some of the motives. He mentions that they're envious. They're envious. That means that they're filled with ill will, jealousy, spite, verse 15. Uh, they're filled with strife. In other words, quarrelings, verse 15. They're filled with selfish ambition, uh, similar to strife, contention, faction, verse 16. And they're not sincere, they're not pure, they're not honest, verse 16. And we see here, they suppose to add affliction to my chains. All these things are, are the reasons why these, you know, people preach. It wasn't for the right motives. And really, I think all these things go back to really one thing, or I guess we could say a few things, but one major thing is ultimately selfishness. Ultimately, that's what it comes back to. These were people who were self-seeking, uh, they did not have a lowliness of mind, as Paul preached in chapter 2, verse 3. They sought their own and not the things that are of Christ Jesus, chapter 2, verse 20. And that's one thing that Paul emphasizes here. Remember, we mentioned last week, and I forgot to mention this in our introduction, but remember the two main themes of this book, mind and joy. Mind and joy. If you don't remember anything else from Philippians, remember the themes, the things that Paul deals with. And he deals with mindset in this book. And it goes back to talk about you know, the importance of mindset, not just doing things, but having the right mindset, and then you're going to do those things if you have the right mindset. And so we're seeing here people who were off in their mindset, people who didn't have the right mindset. And because they didn't have the right mindset, their, their actions were all wrong. Well, actually, I take that back. Their, their actions were right. Their motives were wrong. In fact, we're going to talk about in just a few moments the fact that you could do something very good with the, in the wrong way. You could do something very good with the wrong motives. But nonetheless, what we're seeing here is these people, they, they did something good, but it was with the wrong motive. And, of course, that was not a good thing. They sought their own. They were self-seeking. That's ultimately why they did all these things. Notice verse 17. He's going to go on to talk about those Christians who preach in the right way. 
uh, verse 17 here. He says, But the latter, speaking of those who preach from goodwill, they preach out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. So again, he's speaking about those Christians who preach in the right way. And here, he exposes their motives. What is their motive? Well, as we see here in verse 17, excuse me, it's love. Love is their motive. And of course, love should be our motive for everything that we do. Uh, if God is love, then we should be love too. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, ultimately we can do a lot of good things. You know, Paul says that, you know, we could have faith that can move mountains. I could give my body to be burned. I could do a lot of good things. But if it is absent of love, then ultimately it's nothing. It profits me nothing. And so that's what Paul is saying here. This preaching that you do, proclaiming Christ, being the Christian we ought to be, let everything be done in love. But as we're seeing here specifically, not only just everything in general, but, you know, especially in seeking the lost, you know, that should be done in love. We need to have a zeal for people like Onesiphorus did. He had a zeal. He sought Paul out zealously and found him. He had a, a zeal to serve. He cared for the needs of his brother. And we could say the same thing about us. We need to have that kind of, of zeal for people, a love that motivates us to bring the gospel to others. And I think Jonah is a good example of you know, what not to do. You know, Jonah was certainly one who preached with ulterior motives. He, you know, remember he abandoned the mission at first, but then God finally, in his long suffering and patience, brought him to a point to where he could work with him. And finally, Jonah went and preached. But of course, as we see later in chapter 4, it was not with the right motives. He could care less about those Ninevites. And really, I think the main idea, the main theme of Jonah was that God was trying to teach him. God was trying to teach Jonah to love mercy to love kindness, to love love. And, you know, that was something that Jonah didn't get. And that was something that God was trying to teach him. And, and I think that's something that we can learn from Jonah. He was a preacher who preached with the wrong motives. And we too, when we live the Christian life, when we proclaim the gospel to others, let it be in the right way. Let it be with the right motives. Let's learn to love mercy, to want to help these people, to bring them to God, not out of some kind of selfish motive. Any thoughts, any comments concerning what we've noticed thus far? Okay, notice with me verse 18. Verse 18. This is the last verse here in our context. Uh, so notice with me, he says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. Now, this, I believe, is the second reference to Paul's commenting on joy. Remember, joy is one of the main themes of this epistle. The first reference of joy was way back in uh, verse, uh, verse 4, and that joy was from his remembering the Philippians. And here we see joy referenced again. And this joy was uh, ultimately because Christ was being preached. That's where that joy came from. Uh, but notice, Paul says, what then? He's in essence saying, so what? What then? So what? You know, these people who sought to pain me and harm me by, by preaching with these insincere motives, they have actually really helped me by preaching Christ nonetheless. Now, that's not to say that, you know, these people were not in some way a hindrance uh, to Paul, but in essence, Paul was looking at the bigger picture here. He was taking a step back. Listen, I don't approve of these motives, but nonetheless, I'm so thankful that the actions that they're doing are actually resulting in people coming to the gospel. Again, it's not like he approves of their motives, but he's so happy looking at the big picture here that Christ is still nonetheless being preached. And that's what he says. I he's glad uh, because he, in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ was preached. Again, that's not to say that he didn't mind or even excused you know, these bad intentions of these people, only that, again, Paul was looking at the, at the bigger picture here, that Christ was preached. That was his main motive in everything. That was his greatest prayer. Again, referencing Ephesians and Colossians, his prayer was for boldness and opportunities, not for himself, not for his situations. He cared more about the gospel than he did for Paul. He cared more about proclaiming the truth and saving souls than he did for himself. And... You know, that's what we're seeing here, that Paul certainly, he had that, that right kind of mindset. And so, uh, this brought him joy. 
This brought Paul great joy that the gospel was still being furthered while he was hindered in chains. And I think we're seeing here at least two things, two things that we can draw from, from Paul's statements here in verses 12 through 18. Firstly, we're seeing his priorities. Uh, his priorities were clearly set on spiritual things. Again, if this was any other person, if this, if this was me, if this was, you know, someone else, you know, I, I would probably be discouraged, you know. I'm in prison. I'm standing before Caesar. I'm scared. I'm fearful. But Paul, here in the midst of a rather horrible situation, he's suffering for the cross of Christ, and bad things are happening. He's in prison. He's in chains. And people are preaching with the wrong motives, but yet Paul's taking a step back here. I know this looks bad on the surface, but here's the truth. Everything's good. All's well. Because my chains... This horrible situation has worked out for the furtherance of the gospel. These people who are preaching with wrong motives, these people who, who seek to bring me harm, in essence, have actually helped me. They've actually carried out the very thing that I care about most, which is the gospel. I care less about me. I'm content. I care more about the gospel being proclaimed. And so we're seeing here Paul's priorities. His priorities were set on spiritual things, and he's showing that in the midst of a difficult uh, situation. Another thing that we can take from this is kind of we've already alluded to, but his outlook, a very positive outlook. You know, I believe the Bible, in my opinion, may change on this, but I believe the Bible is, kind of has a realist look at things. You know, there are, there's optimism, there's pessimism, and there's realism, which is right in the middle. And the Bible deals with both negative themes and positive themes. We need both. We must have both. There are times where we must rebuke, and there are times where we must encourage. The Bible has a very real look, but at the same time, when it comes to how we feel, when it comes to the kind of things that God has blessed us with, I think, you know, in a sense, while we are realists, we're also very, very kind of optimists too, you know. I think really the Bible is, is filled with, with great optimism, but we also see some, also some very negative themes. Now, the Bible's not pessimistic, okay? The Bible does not, you know, dwell on negative things. It deals with negative things. Being negative... Looking at the negative is different from pessimism, which is being entrenched in only negative things. Okay, the Bible's not pessimistic whatsoever, but it does deal with negative themes. It deals with our enemy, it deals with hell, it deals with sin, it deals with punishment. The Bible's very real. It deals with re the reality of things, you know? And so we see that balance within the scriptures. But nonetheless, when it comes to, you know, our outlook on life, yes, we need to have that balanced view, a realist view of the negative things, the positive things. Consider the, both the goodness and the severity of God, right? God has that balance within himself. He's both the lion and the lamb. You know, there is great balance within the scriptures. That's kind of what realism is. But nonetheless, at the same time, we're also filled with great optimism too. You know, we, though there are negative things that exist while in this life, we have that optimistic view of one day being in a place where there is no negative thing where we're filled with joy, where joy is completed, where we get to spend eternity with each other and, and, of course, with God forever. And so, you know, we're seeing here in the midst of Paul's situations a very optimistic, very positive outlook. All is well is, in essence, what he's saying. Now, I think there are a lot of lessons that we can take from this. One thing I'll, I'll conclude on is uh, simply the point that I think what we're seeing here is that, you know, really you can do something good but well, you can do it in a wrong way. You can carry out good actions, but you might have the wrong motives behind it. I think we see that same kind of thing in Malachi's day. Remember what God said, you know, you're bringing to me all these different sacrifices, those things that you've taken in robbery, those things that are, are, are blind and, and, and dumb and, and, and ultimately just poor things. And God says, offer this to your governor. How would he respond? He'd be offended if you tried to offer him these, these subpar terrible offerings, but you're trying to bring these to me. You're trying to bring these to your creator. You think I'm going to accept them? And so these people, they were bringing God's sacrifices all right, but they were doing it with the wrong motive. They really, their heart wasn't in it. And remember what God concluded there in Malachi. He said, I'd rather, I'd rather you just bar up the doors of the temple than bring me something that is like this. Bring me these subpar sacrifices. And, you know, again, it goes to show that you can, you can do good things. And you can do so with the wrong motives. And that's what we see here with these people. You know, they preach Christ, but they did so with the wrong motives. Paul's not saying I, I commend that or excuse that, but he is taking a step back and looking at the big picture here. Nonetheless, despite their motives, Christ is being preached, souls are being saved. And that, my friends, is what it all goes back to. 
in this context here. Paul's reason for rejoicing. That was the theme of this context, and here we see that reason. His reason for rejoicing is that things have worked out for the good, that Christ is being preached. Uh, thank you for your attention. We're going to continue, of course, our study next week into verses 19 uh, through 26 next week. So thank you for your comments and for your attention this morning.